All right, guys. Great to see everybody, by the way. This is Memorial Day weekend, and I do thank Greg for actually praying for the troops. In the Bible, it actually, you always wonder, what what is the relationship that we as a church actually have to the world around us? And actually, the Bible is actually pretty clear in a lot of things. One thing it's clear about in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3, it says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercessions, and then thanksgiving be made for all people. But then he also says this, Paul does, he says, for kings and for those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases our God and Savior. And actually, that's what the troops do. They actually fight for us so that we can actually indeed live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So we are grateful for them. This is actually a pretty big week. This has been, a, it seems like every week at Providence Church is a big week. There's always something going on. Uh, for me personally, it's a, it's a bittersweet deal. Our baby Noel is now, a pro, I guess she's three weeks old now, four weeks, three and a half, three and a half weeks old now. And uh, w- it's been a joyous time, but the sad thing is, is now the meals are kind of tapering off. It's been amazing. Some, there's, some <laughs> there's been some folks, there's some folks around here who can really rustle up some good vittles. Uh, good news on the personal note with Greg Mercer. Where's Mercer? He's, go ahead, stand up, Greg. Greg passed his test. Out of college, out, out of high school algebra, and on to geometry. <laughs> He's now a professional engineer. Nice work, Greg. Uh, Eddie is starting his internship in uh, Oklahoma. He had a, actually had a pretty big week. Ashley, you want to share anything? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Sometimes I think we, we lose focus in this world and we kind of get so wrapped up in the stuff that we do that we forget how big and how powerful God is and how really small man is. Uh, you know, this last week with the tornadoes kind of reminded us of that. Remember a few years ago there was that terrible tsunami that killed 200,000 people or whatever it was. And you realize that really the power of nature is incredibly strong and that actually as clever as we are with all the medicine that we have, Uh, with all the nutritious foods and supplements and vitamins and exercises and 24-hour fitness and all this stuff that really we don't control things. We're not in charge. We don't number the days of our lives. Really, there's a plan marked out for us. Uh, You know, the tornadoes that ripped through Oklahoma are are a good example of that. You know, last week, there's a, I guess, from what I understand, there's 24 people that were killed in those tornadoes, many of which, tragically, were children. Um, there were 13,000 homes destroyed, so thousands and thousands of people displaced. Uh, there was amazing response, of course. There were big organizations that responded. Um, there were churches that brought food and shelter or, and money and time and invested into the people there. Uh, the storm was actually classified as an EF5, which is actually the largest uh, tornadoes that there are. Uh, this tornado itself was actually 1.3 miles, miles wide, miles wide. Uh, Its path of destruction lasted 40 minutes through the town of uh, Moore, Oklahoma, and uh, it was 40 minutes and 17 miles by 1.3, so a vast area of total destruction. And I read something that was actually pretty interesting. It says here that uh, scientists actually estimate that it's somewhere between six and 600,000, and most people say it's on the high end, times the power and intensity and energy released by the, the, uh, the bomb at Hiroshima. So we think about the destruction of nuclear weapons that man creates, but it's tiny, tiny, tiny relative to the power that nature can unleash. Amidst the confusion and the chaos that ensued in Oklahoma, of course, there were a bunch of people that rushed in, politicians, as we talked about, charitable groups, Christians. There were, you know, other religious groups were there as well. But uh, of the folks that rushed in, there were some people, uh, among them were reporters, of course, and everybody's looking to make a headline, make a story. One of the people that showed up was a dude named Wolf Blitzer, who's from CNN. He had a, 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 a very well-publicized interaction with a lady whose name was Rebecca, I think, Vitson or Vitzman, or I, I really don't know how to say her last name. But if you've seen the news clips, it was, it was him standing clearly in the middle of a home that had been destroyed. And you see this poor lady, she's holding a small child, what is clear, and clearly what is her destroyed home. And, he, and evidently, she had made a decision that had saved her life and the life of her son. And Wolf Blitzer, he asked her, he asked her a question. He said, did you thank the Lord, you know, in parentheses, that you were able to make that decision to escape to safety? And, and the lady kind of looked at him funny, and, and then he had, repeated the question. He said, did you thank the Lord that you were able to escape with your life? The lady 
you know, with a sh- after a short pause, she says, I'm actually an atheist. And they both chuckle, you know, and it was actually a fairly lighthearted exchange. It ended on a relatively high and, and gregarious note. That's an Eddie word. <laughs> Not write that one down. And uh, it, it ended actually fairly well. Uh, but I, I, it just kind of occurred to me that you see this amazing power, and yet you claim you're an atheist. And, I, and to me, I was, I was starting to think about it. You know, there's a lot of people in this world that claim themselves to be of some kind of persuasion. You know, they'll say, I'm an atheist, I'm an agnostic, I'm a, I'm a Christian deist, I'm a, you know, it, we in churches are guilty of that. We'll say, you know, you'll talk about, are you a Christian? And they'll say, I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Mormon, or I'm a Muslim, or I'm a this, or I'm a that. I'm a, but really, what does the Bible have to say about people? Who are we? Are there really these clear distinctions that we, we like to claim? So to do this, if, if, for those of you who do have your Bibles, we're actually going to open up to Romans 1, and we're going to camp out there for a little while. So Romans is, uh, if, again, if you've got your Bibles, if you hit Acts, take a right. If you get to the, any of the Corinthian stuff, take a left. We are going to put in at uh, Romans 1.18, but while you're turning there, that just interesting to note, I don't know if you know this, but that term atheist it just means a is the is the prefix and thea theist is the, you know comes from the Latin and Greek word. Well, Latin is actually dio and I think Greek is thea, but it means just atheist, not 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 God. So an atheist is somebody who doesn't believe in God. In Romans one eighteen, if you're able to get there, it says, "For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness." We're going to talk a little bit about what this means later, but for the time being, really kind of camp out on that word suppress. It says, of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And really what that word means is hold down. So what, what the Bible says is that even though some people claim to be atheists, they actually know in their heart of hearts that there is a God. The theory is that you can't look out at the sky, you can't see the immensity of the universe, you can't see the beauty of a sunset and, and deny that there is a God. And so when it talks about that word suppress, it's kind of like being at Shelley's new pool and you have a basketball and you're in the pool and you're trying to hold that basketball down. That basketball really wants to come up. He's trying to pop up however you can, but you're still pushing it down, pushing it down. So in other words, you're actually in contact with the thing that you're actually trying to hold down. And that's really what men are in, in this world. Um, so they're really, the Bi- way the Bible describes it, there really are no atheists actually. So the, for simplicity of today's talk, I'm really just going to say that the, the Bible basically breaks the world down into two people groups, even though they're, I understand it is more complex than that. There are people that will classify themselves uh, that we can classify people as deists. In other words, people that actually know in their heart of hearts that there is a God. And there's actually people that respond to the knowledge that there is a God because, you know, for example, Michael wants to share the gospel. They respond to Revelation and they, they accept the revelation of God, and change their lives. It transforms everything in an instant. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about, there is actually a system of thought around in this world that actually is called deism. So remember, just believing in God makes you a deist, but there's actually a system of thought that actually is representative of deism. In other words, people say that with reason and with thought, we can actually come to the knowledge of God, but that actually doesn't trans- transform lives. And actually, that is a correct, correct way of thinking. In other words, people do int- intimately know that there is a God. They actually can look out at the universe and reason in their heart of hearts that there is a God and that he's a big and a powerful God. So still in Romans, we're going to read from 119, which is the next verse here. It says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. And actually, what, if, you, if you understood that last phrase, it says they are without excuse. In other words, the Bible teaches that not only do you know there's a God, but actually you read actually later in Romans 2 that actually when you stand before God, when you die, because all men die, when you stand before God, that everybody knows that there is a God to such, an, to such a degree that actually you stand there and you, you can't say, well, I didn't know. God says that clearly you knew my fingerprint was all over the skies and the heavens. My fingerprint was in your soul. It was in your heart. You knew it. In fact, not only do we understand that God exists from nature, we actually understand that God exists from the order of nature as well. In other words, 
you know, the earth spins around and around. Some things never change. It's going to keep moving around the sun 365 days a year. That's semi-predictable. Uh, in other words, we kind of got a feel for it. There's a huge universe that in, most scientists assume that math and science can kind of explain what, what's going on. But all that, mean, all that to say is that really there's a, a, a rational creator that kind of spun this world into existence. So not only is there a big God, but he seems to be a, at least a semi-rational God that we can you know, use reason and logic to kind of fig- not figure him out, but at least to understand that there's something bigger and better out there. We also know internally that there is a God, and the scripture says that because actually there's this thing within all of our hearts called a conscience. And that's where it really, really Romans 2 and Romans 3 kind of goes into. It talks about the conscience. So it says that no man can stand before God because he knows that he has violated his conscience. Within his, within this, the, his being, we all know that it's not okay to steal. It's not okay to kill. It's not okay to uh, commit murder. It's not okay, adultery is not okay. We know it's not okay to swear to God. We know that these things aren't okay, and we, we actually can't stand before God because in our heart of hearts, we know that we've actually committed sin. And actually, our just God... And we'll learn about that. Our just God is a God that demands perfection. And so that we stand before him and we've actually been angry. Jesus says, if you get angry with your brother, you're guilty of murder. So we can't stand there. We can't actually say, well, God, you didn't teach me. You didn't learn me. You didn't learn me good, as they say in Texas. Uh, it, I'm going to read a, from Psalm 19. If, if you want to flip there, you can. But keep your finger there on, in Romans Psalm 19, somewhere between 20 and 18. Uh, Psalm 19, 1 through 2. In fact, if you have time, I'd encourage you just to read this whole psalm because it, it screams about, about how there's a God out there who's actually wanting to talk to us and, and, and he has something to say just through the creation. It says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is decl- declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. So there he is. God is all around us. But really, when it comes down to it, we don't really know much more about God from creation other than the fact that, you know, explicitly, other than he is a very, very big God and that he is incredibly powerful. But the Bible actually has a lot to say more than just that he's a big and powerful, powerful God. This idea that we actually know God through what's been made and, and through our experience, through our through this, uh, this thing we, ha- we have called the conscience. That's, in general, some people call that general revelation. In other words, all men know it. It's generally understood. So that's what some people call general revelation. Uh, but again, general revelation, the way the Bible describes it, is we're all born into this world as what, you know, I'm going to call it deists, but people who believe in God that, but suppress the truth and unrighteousness. It's like we know that there's truth, but yet we turn from the truth, it's kind of like you, you're, you're starving in the desert, you're, you're dying of thirst, your mouth is dry, and, and your lips are chapped, and you make it to the well, but you have nothing to draw with. You know, it's kind of like a, I kind of like, think about it a little bit like a dude who grew up in San Diego who's really into surfing, owns all the surfboards, but spends all his, de- all his time watching surfing television and never gets out of the house. So you're there, but you just missed it, dude. And uh, I like this one, there was a... Uh, it's kind of like a biker. It's kind of like a dude, a biker who shows up to a biker bar, but he's wearing spandex with a bicycle. Wrong kind of bar. Wrong kind of biker. <laughs> uh, you're close, but you kind of missed the boat here. Um, in, in essence, really, we, we fail to respond to Revelation, and we don't want to be there. We want to enjoy the fullness of life that actually we find when we start to respond to what God has to say to us when we experience what it's like to experience that transformation from death into life, from darkness into light, from being the natural man, the carnal man, into being a spiritual man. I remember earlier, Jose said, I, I said, God is good. He said, God is good. I said, God changes a lot. And then I don't remember, remember what you said, but you said God changes. It was one word. You said everything. It was actually a pretty beautiful exchange. But actually, you know, the, our God, the God of the Bible, he actually wants to say more to us than just that he's big and powerful. In other words, more than just that there's a fingerprint out there, he actually tries very hard to demonstrate who he is in words, in, in, in this idea of special revelation, where actually he wants to communicate directly with you, 
not in some like weirdo Ouija board way, but, but he's actually demonstrated in the past that he does communicate to people. There's all sorts of ways he, com- he communicates directly to people. Uh, he communicates directly through people. He communicates through his Holy Spirit. Uh, he communicates uh, in other ways. For example, his work on the cross. I've got a few examples here. Moses, who was a great prophet of old, who was a leader of Israel, actually spoke directly to God. In fact, it says, just a, a, I just like this passage, so I just had to find a way to squeeze it in. It says, For I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Then go, even I, I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. In other words, Moses was actually saying, you know, I know that there's a God. I know that you've come to me. I want to respond, but I can't, I can't quite hack it. You know, I'm slow of speech. I'm slow of tongue. And God says, I made your mouth. I made the words. I'm going to speak through you. So here it is. Here's God speaking to Moses, and then in turn, Moses speaking to humanity with the word of God. One, another one of my, another example I've got here is this guy, Amos, who's one of the minor prophets. Minor doesn't mean unimportant. It just means small Amos replied to this, du- this other guy. He says, I am not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore trees. But the Lord took me from following my flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Another, another example of somebody actually just sitting in a field and God saying, hey, I want to share myself with you. I want to disclose myself to you. You know that I exist because you've been in the fields. You've seen the procreation through your livestock. You've seen what it's like for me to provide you with these sycamore figs. But yet, that's not good enough. I'm, I'm actually going to communicate with you. Jesus, of course, is a great example of revelation, what we can call special revelation, specific revelation. That is, he goes beyond saying that I'm big and I'm powerful. Jesus came into this world, and, and for those of you who wonder and maybe on the fence and say, well, where is God? I wish he would show himself to me. If he only showed himself to me, I would respond, and I would respond appropriately. But there's this interesting exchange with this dude, Philip, he was one of, actually one of his followers. So Jesus had a bunch of followers who barely listened to him, who really, when he died, I don't know if you remember this, but most of the, his followers actually completely deserted him and left him. In fact, I believe only the apostle John was there as he was being crucified. But anyway, this guy Philip, he said, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, How can you say, show us the Father? In other words, Jesus himself is showing us the Father. His life on this earth is actually enough for us to respond in a way that is appropriate to God, the creator of heaven and earth. Uh, The Apostle John says, from the beginning we have heard what we have seen, what we have uh, seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, and what we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So God actually demonstrates, talks to us, actually through a physical way, when Jesus came onto this earth, the Apostle John's trying to say, he's screaming at us, saying, look, dude, I've touched it, I've seen it. It's kind of like that, you know, it's like that boy who cried wolf, where, you know, he's he's seen the wolf, eventually he's seen the wolf, and he's trying to explain to him, I look, this time I really saw him, there is a big wolf, he's got teeth, I touched him, I, I felt him, I smelt his breath, it's nasty. Run away. But people don't, he didn't, people didn't respond, of course, to that story, but people do respond to Jesus. In a great example of God the Father actually wanting to disclose himself, there's the most famous of all the Bible verses, of course, is John 3.16, where he says, God so loved the you know, world that he gave his only begotten son. You, do you know it? What is it? Hey! Yay! Man, that's good. I bet I could call on most of you and you wouldn't get it. <laughs> I bet I could call on her parents and they wouldn't get it. <laughs> Brian, you want to stand up and do it? <laughs> but, uh, so, so God actually demonstrates and, and tries to speak to us directly through his son. Uh, the Holy Spirit actually, what the Bible teaches is that God actually gives us the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's actually communicating with us. Uh, Paul, numerous times in the, in the book of Romans, said the Holy Spirit within me was provoking me to go here or to do, do this or to say this. So actually God with, it, is within us trying to communicate to us. And uh, of course, in, in, in one of the best examples of, of what we call special revelation or the way that God intends to communicate through us is actually with 
this thing right here, this, uh, this book called the Bible, which is God's word. And uh, evidently, God thinks pretty highly of this, because if you open it up to uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, And if you looked at 316, this is another great 316 verse. There's actually several really good 316 verses in the Bible. I don't know if that's just coincidence, but this is another great one. Because it says that all scripture is inspired by God uh, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped, and good for every work. Uh, so, but but the, it's kind of interesting that, that inspired verse, the inspired word, it actually means God breathed, like literally God breathed it out even though he wasn't actually dictating to a dude like joseph smith was being dictated to but supposedly by you know by god and he's writing down these on these golden plates actually god breathed human authors and actually somehow intended exactly what god uh, wanted to speak and so the scripture is god breathed so here it is god's trying to speak to us and if we we're able to respond in kind we would start to learn things that transform our lives we under, we would start to learn that you know, God does not take into account, or love does not take into account wrong suffered. Uh, we would start to learn if we picked up God's word and his revelation that we are, we were yet, we, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If we would pick up God's word and, 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 and listen to it, we would know that we, would, we never walk alone in this world. We know that he will never leave us for, nor forsake us. And we know that perfect love casts out fear. Uh, we know that greater love hath no one than this than one laid down his life for his friends. We know that love is patient, love is kind, love is, love is, is not provoked to jealousy. We know that Jesus came to serve, not to be served, and that he would give his life as a ransom for many. And we learn by picking up his word and praying and talking to God and listening to God and not quenching the Holy Spirit, we learn that our lives can actually be transformed. Our marriages can go from chaos into calm. We learn that we can deal with a, a painful boss we learn that we can deal with a neighbor who's not very nice. We learn all of these things from God's word. And so I just encourage everyone today that we actually pick up God's word and respond to it. Pray, get on your knees. Some people spend more time watching King James on TV than reading their King James. Um, there's just, there's opportunities each and every day. That was a bad one. Uh, I, I tried. Thanks. Uh, and that's actually why Paul, having experienced, I think, in fact, Jose, you were mentioning before that Paul actually experienced this special revelation. In other words, God came directly into his life when he was on the road to Damascus, and it changed everything. He went from going left to going right. He went from being a murderer uh, to being a lover of people. He went from really claiming to fight for God, but actually went and transformed his life into following the one living and true God. And so we need to be like Paul and, and listen to his special revelation and to respond to it in kind. And uh, I guess just, just closing out here, as we go about you know, this, this life, we need to be prayerful. We need to be anxious to pick up God's word and less anxious about what's on TV. Uh, we need to care less about you know, the latest news story and more about what God wants for our life. And uh, yeah, I know for myself here, and I, I'm sure this is the prayer for all of the folks in the congregation, that uh, maybe one day we can pray that a certain woman named Rebecca, who lives in Moore, Oklahoma, would recognize that from the dust she was taken and from the dust she shall return, and that blessed be the name of the Lord, and that maybe one day when she's asked, you know, do you give thanks to the Lord, her response will be a resounding yes. Yes, we give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So let's, in all things... I want to close out with just this one scripture. It says, um, it tells us in uh, 2 Timothy or 2 Thessalonians uh, 2 5. This is actually one of Natalie and I's memorization verse, but I won't call on her because I want lunch. In uh, 2 5 16, it says, uh, Rejoice always. So let's, in all things, let's rejoice. Let's pray without ceasing. And let's, in everything we do, let's give thanks for this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. So let's do that. Let's just have a heart of gratitude where we're 
eager to go to prayer, and we're ready to give everything and all to Christ. Uh, So dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you that you're a big and a gracious God. We thank we thank you that you uh, you go way out of your way to attempt to display who you are to us, and that really all Lord we have to do is accept your testimony, to respond in kind, uh, to accept your love, and we ask that as we accept your revelation in our lives, that our lives in turns would be uh, transformed, that there would be something pleasing about us that would draw uh, others to you that we would lay down our lives, that we would uh, be prayerful, that we, we, we as men in this church would lead our families with gentleness, that we would not exasperate our children, that wives of this church would love their families, love their husbands, that we would all, as Michael is attempting to do, dedicate our lives to uh, spreading the good news that, that, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we thank you so much for your love and for your mercy. Amen.